Hello Internet, Seth Skorikowski, and welcome to part 5 of our epically sized review slash overview for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Now in previous episodes we've discussed character creation, where we created our character Jack Malone, and we've also discovered skill mechanics. So in this episode what we're going to do is we're going to bring those two things together and we're going to discuss combat. Now, as I've said before, Call of Cthulhu is not a combat-based system. Its basis is in role-play and investigation. However, combat is still very important to the game, and as I'm about to show, very dynamic and extremely fatal. For this, we're going to be using the front half of the character sheet. Combat is divided into rounds, but how long a game round lasts was left intentionally vague. A combat round is said to last long enough for each character to make an action. Now, while it's not strictly defined, I like to say that as a good rule of thumb, a combat round should last between 5 and 10 seconds with a little bit of elasticity to that. In a game round, a character may initiate an attack using melee fighting, firearms or throw, perform a fighting maneuver, flee, cast a spell, or perform any other action such as picking a lock or first aid. Combat order is determined by dexterity, with the highest dexterity going first. Of course, a character can always hold their action until later in the round, or skip their turn any round they want if they wish, it's completely up to them. Now, if two or more characters have the same dexterity score, the character with the highest combat skill is said to be the one that goes first. However, personally in my games, I don't have any problem with simultaneous actions. Most combat is going to fall into two categories, melee fighting and firearms. So let's start with melee. The most common skill that's used in melee fighting is brawl, which our character has a 53. Brawl includes things like kicking, punching, biting, scratching, basic weapons such as knives, clubs, and improvised weapons. But there are other categories for fighting as well. Axe, flail, garrote, spear, sword, whip, and even chainsaw are all different combat skills. When a character initiates an attack, they roll percentage dice as they would any other skill check. If that roll comes up that it's an extreme success, the one-fifth value of the skill, and in our character's case a 10 or lower, something very special happens. If the weapon is a blunt weapon, such as a fist or a boot or a club, the weapon does maximum damage. If the character has a damage bonus, then they do maximum damage bonus as well. If the weapon is an edged weapon or something that pierces the body, such as a knife, a sword, or a bullet, then we have what's called an impaling strike. In the case of an impaling strike, we give it maximum weapon damage and maximum damage bonus damage if there is any, just like we would to a blunt weapon, but then we roll regular weapon damage and add that to it. Impaling strikes can be extremely devastating. For example, our character Jack does 1 die 3 damage plus damage bonus when he hits someone unarmed. So on an extreme success, he does 7 points of damage. If he uses his Switchblade, which also uses the Brawl Melee skill, and he hits with an extreme success, he'll cause maximum weapon damage, which is 4 points, maximum damage bonus damage, also 4 points, and then he rolls a D4 for the weapon damage, the Switchblade again, making his damage potential anywhere from 8 plus 1 die 4 points of damage. Yeah, you cultist punk. In the next 5 to 10 seconds, I got a 53% chance of ruining your day, and a 10% chance of ruining your life. Now, the target of this attack does have the option of stopping this from happening, because they also get to roll as well. The target of a melee attack has two choices. They can dodge using their dodge skill, or they can choose to fight back using an appropriate melee fighting skill. If the character chooses dodge, they must roll their dodge skill and achieve the same or better level of success than the attacker's skill roll, ties of course going to the defender, meaning that they at that point manage to dodge or parry the attack from hitting. However, if the defending attacker chooses to fight back, it means that they seize an opening enough time to get in a quick jab or a quick thrust and be able to actually damage the attacker instead of having the attacker hurt them. But in these cases, the character that's fighting back must roll at a better skill level than the attack roll, otherwise the original attack roll connects and the character might get damage. In the event that a character fights back, and they roll an extreme success, they do not get the extreme success damage. 
Extreme success damage only happens if the character is the instigator of the attack that's being made. Now, characters may become overwhelmed if they're facing a lot of different opponents at the same time, and they all gather up and they cluster around them. So in a combat, if a character has already used their dodge skill and or their fight back skill in any round, that means that they're at this point considered overwhelmed. They still get an opportunity to dodge or fight back any more melee attacks coming at them. However, all of the, the attackers at that point get a bonus die to their attack rolls. Now, some creatures also get more than one attack around, such as a ghoul gets three attacks around. So for creatures that get more than one attack around, they can dodge or fight back as many times as they normally get a regular attack. So if a group of investigators were to swarm this ghoul with melee attacks, it wouldn't be until the fourth attack in a single round was made against this ghoul that the attacker would be able to get a bonus die on that attack. And once again, just to be clear, this is only for melee fighting. This has nothing to do with the firearms as far as getting a bonus die for the more people attacking a target. Now, melee fighting doesn't always mean damage. It can also mean fighting maneuvers. Fighting maneuvers include, but are not limited to things such as holds, disarms, knocking an opponent down, and knockout blows. When a character attempts a fighting maneuver, the first thing they have to do is compare their build score with the build score of the target. For our character, he has a build score of 1. A character can attempt to maneuver with a target that's its own build or lower, and they can do this at just regular difficulty. If the opponent is one build category larger than the attacker, then the attacker has a penalty die to the skill roll. If the opponent is two build sizes larger than the attacker, the attacker has two penalty dice. And if the opponent is three or more sizes larger, the attacker is not able to instigate a fighting maneuver against them. There's also thrown attacks. Throw is its own skill. Our character doesn't have it, so we begin with a starting base of 20%. The distance that an item can be thrown is based off of strength, which in our case is 70. A palm-sized object can be hurled one-fifth of a character's strength in yards. That's the base range. It can be hurled twice that amount with a hard difficult roll, and up to four times that amount with an extreme difficult roll. Characters do receive a damage bonus or uh, thrown attacks, but it's one half of their normal damage bonus. So in our case, it would be a die 2 instead of a die 4 if our Jack Malone character decides to throw a weapon. A hurled weapon can be dodged by the target, but it cannot be fought back, unless the target is one-fifth of their character's decks away and feet from the attacker. So if, for our character, if our attacker throws something at us, and they're within 11 feet of our character, our character can choose to either dodge or fight back this attack. However, if the attacker is more than 11 feet away, our character only has the option to dodge. Now let's discuss firearms. The character sheet comes automatically filled in, with handgun and rifle shotgun skills already filled in. But others firearm specializations include bow, which includes crossbow, heavy weapons, things like grenade launchers and rockets, flamethrowers, machine guns, submachine guns, which that category includes assault rifles that are set on burst or automatic fire. Firearm combat works much in the same way as regular melee fighting, but if the character has their gun out at the beginning of a combat round, they get to add plus 50 to their dex order, which gives them a serious advantage and potential of going first. However, that plus 50 only happens if a character begins their combat round by pulling the trigger. Which means that if I stop my round by just pulling the trigger, I get to add 50 to my initiative order, giving me 105. But if I so much as take a single step before I pull this trigger, I only get to go on my regular 55. To attack with a firearm, players just need to roll their skill roll. The base range for a firearm is listed under each specific firearm. In our case, with our 45, that comes to 15 yards. Now that's at regular difficulty at 15 yards. For twice that range, up to 30 yards, it's done at a hard difficulty. An extreme difficulty if we wanted to fire up to four times our base range, in this case 60 yards. Now if a target is at extreme range, and the only way we can possibly hit that target because it's so far away is to roll an extreme success, if we roll at extreme success, we do not get the extreme damage or the impaling strike benefit because that was the minimum that we needed in order to even hit them. 
and we can still get an impaling strike if we roll a critical hit, which is an ought one. But if it requires an extreme difficulty just to even hit them, you don't get extreme bonus damage once you manage to. Now, while we are on the subject of impaling damage, a 45 that scores an impaling strike would do maximum damage, which is 12 points, plus an additional 1 die 10 plus 2, giving the damage potential to be 15 to 24 points of damage for a single bullet, which if you notice our hit points are only 15, that is devastating. A character could fire only once in a combat round. However, with handguns, there might be another, another number that's listed in brackets. In our case, that's three. So with this particular gun, we could have the option of firing it up to three times in a combat round. But if we choose to fire our gun more than once in a round, every single attack roll that's made that round with that firearm comes with a penalty die. Because I'm not taking my time to aim and line up that perfect shot and go boom. No, I'm rushing this, probably because I'm afraid for my life and I ain't aiming, I'm just boom, boom, boom. The final field here is weapon malfunction. In this case, this gun malfunctions on a roll of 100. If an attack roll rolls a weapon malfunction, that means that the gun has some form of mechanical issue that has prevented it from firing, and it's going to require one die six rounds and a successful firearm or mechanical repair roll in order to clear the gun. If that roll is also a fumble, which in this case 100 would also can be considered a fumble, then the keeper gets to decide if that 100 means that it's a weapon jam, or if it's a fumble such as the character shoots themselves or shoots their buddy or some other goofy stuff that could happen. Now firing an automatic weapon is a very different thing, and this is a little bit difficult to get used to at first, but it works pretty well. For that, what we do is we divide the number of bullets that are fired in that round into bursts. The size of a burst depends on what the character's skill level is. It's going to be one-tenth of a character's skill level. However, there's going to be a minimum of three bullets per burst. So if we don't get a fourth bullet until we reach 40th level, uh, once we reach level 50, we get five bullets, etc., etc. Each burst is going to be rolled separately. The first burst is rolled at regular difficulty. The second burst receives a penalty die. The third burst has two penalty die. The fourth burst increases the difficulty to hard and has two penalty die. And the fifth burst increases the difficulty by two ranks, now extreme, and comes with two penalty die in order to hit. If a character fires a burst and scores a hit, one half rounding down of those bullets in that burst are going to hit the target. So if it's a three round burst, one bullet's going to hit. Four round burst, two bullets are going to hit. Now, if this character uh, player rolls and they get an extreme success, that means that every bullet in that burst does successfully hit its target, and one half, rounding down, are going to be impaling strikes. There are several other modifiers for firearm combat, such as if the target is prone, or if they're very large, or they're very small, or if the target's moving, and for all of that, the Keeper's Guide does give this handy chart. In a bit, I'm also going to show you my personal combat page that I've made for my players that has these modifiers as some others as well. If a character finds himself being shot at, they do get the option to try to get out of the way. Even if it isn't their turn yet, a character may die for cover, either scrambling onto the ground or behind a wall in an attempt to get out of the way before the bullets hit. Now, if a character elects to die for cover, they first must be aware that somebody is going to be shooting at them, and they're not planning on just standing there like an idiot while that happens. The first thing they have to do is roll a dodge roll. If that dodge roll is successful, the attacker receives a penalty die in their firearms check. So the target must decide that they're going to roll a dodge roll prior to the attack roll being made. Now, regardless of whether that dodge roll is successful or not, the character is going to lose their next action of the combat round, which is either going to be later that round if they haven't gone yet, or if they have already gone yet, they get to lose their attack at the beginning of the, for the next round. So they always get to lose their next attack if they choose to die for cover, and the only option they have during that time is just to dodge any further attacks. Now, while the rules don't specify how far a character moves when they die for cover, my house rule is that they can move one-fifth of the character's decks and feet away from where they were when they decided to dive. So in our character's case, that's up to 11 feet they can do when they dive for cover. Now for surprise attacks. Surprise attacks only happen on the first round of combat, with a target being unaware that they're about to be attacked, hence the word surprised. 
a character is likely going to get some sort of role in order to help them realize that this attack is coming. Maybe a listen check or a spot check or a combined listen and spot role. Or if they're maybe talking to somebody face to face and they might be able to see that moment of intent right before that person just up and kicks them in the nards and get to roll a psychology roll to maybe be aware this is about to happen. Now if the target is unaware that this attack is coming, melee attacks might automatically be successful. Though it should still be rolled for success, that way we know if it might have been a fumble or not. But depending on the situation, such as the character is wanting to do a fighting maneuver rather than just hit or kick them, uh, the game master might say that they still need a roll, but they just get a bonus die to that action because the target is unaware. Now, if the attack is going to be a ranged attack, such as a sniper shot, the attacker receives only a bonus die. There is no automatic success with ranged attacks. But in no cases is the surprise target going to be allowed the options to dodge, fight back, or dive for cover. It's going to be completely dependent on the attacker's ability to hit them, with nothing being able to prevent that on the character's side. Once the surprise attack is complete, the rest of the characters are allowed to make their actions that round, and then the following round we can begin with just completely normal combat order, just like regular combat. Now let's talk about movement. Now during a combat round, a character can move up to their movement rate in yards and still make their attack roll as normal. So for our character, that would be 8 yards they can move and still make a normal attack. Now a character may also sprint up to 5 times that amount and still get an attack, but with a penalty die. If their action is set at the end of this run, such as they're going to be sprinting across a field in order to get a good shot off, or they're going to be sprinting across a warehouse to do a flying kick into a deep one, if the attack is at the very end of the sprint, the keeper might elect to have that action happen at the very end of the round when they get to make that attack roll, but that's completely up to the keeper's discretion. Now for those of you that don't like taking damage, there is also armor. Now armor doesn't reduce an attacker's chances of actually hitting you. We don't have armor class or anything like that, but it does reduce the damage that happens when an attacker does hit you. Now most Call of Cthulhu characters, being everyday, ordinary people that have found themselves in an extraordinary situation, are very likely not going to have any form of armor. But armor could also mean things such as a wooden door or a car body. The Keeper's Guide does offer this handy little chart of some example armor values. So if our character were wearing a heavy leather jacket, they could reduce any damage they take through this jacket by one point of damage. Or if they're wearing a World War I helmet, any attacks to the head are at minus two damage. One thing that I do find annoying is that while there are values for modern day body armor, eight points, there are no values or prices listed for 1920s body armor. So I looked it up and yeah, they totally had body armor in the 1920s. In fact, there was this disturbing fad of shooting each other for demonstration purposes. But I did also find a 1927 sporting good catalog that lists two models of bulletproof vests for sale. For $40, you could get front-only protection, and for $75, you could get all-around bulletproof protection. Now, as far as the armor value that it's for, if you check the Investigator's Weapon Guide, it lists that a steel line bulletproof vest is going to be 5 points of armor. So there you go. $40 for 5 points in the front, $75 for all the way around on the torso. Now since the armor, like vests and helmets, aren't going to cover the entire body, there comes a question when a character gets hit of did it hit the armor or did it hit an unarmored portion. And there are two different ways that a keeper could approach this. The first one could be that the player just simply rolls a luck roll, and if they got lucky that means that the bullet hit their armor and they can reduce the damage. The other option, and the one that I personally use, is this nice little chart that lists optional hit locations, and you can find this in the Keeper's Guide. Now, before we go on, let's go back to that catalog I just showed. You'll notice on the right side of that page, there's a Thompson submachine gun for sale. The price for it was $175 or $200 for the one that's got a compensator and a 20 round magazine. Here's another one that I found, this one from 1929, that lists the same price. The Call of Cthulhu rulebook lists automatic weapons at way too high of a price, showing this Thompson submachine gun here for $1,000 plus black market markup, and that is incorrect. Up until the 1934 National Firearms Act, it was completely legal to purchase an automatic weapon in the United States. I mean, you could even order them through the mail. It was a very different time back then. 
Now, the other prices that are in the extensive price guide and the keeper's guide and the investigator's handbook, those are all very good and I like them a lot, but automatic weapons are set just too damned high. Now, that's about it for combat. There's a few small things that we didn't go into, such as knockout blows and that sort of thing. But before we move on to the next section, there's a couple things I also want to mention. The first is the combat flow chart from the Keeper's Guide. Print this out and give this to your players. The next thing I should mention is the other forms of damage table. This thing is super handy for keepers to use and they're trying to determine damage for all the different types of things such as drowning or being hit by a car or just to help calculate what they should set damage at for some sort of unforeseeable sort of way that a player character is going to inadvertently hurt themselves because players are always going to come up with some way to get injured that no game designer has ever ever considered. Now for my game, another thing that I did is that I compiled a cheat sheet of all the different combat rules and I then I printed this out and gave it to my players. This page has been a lifesaver for us, having everything in one nice spot. That way during combat, we don't have to stop the action and flip through the books in order to find a rule. I went ahead and put a link below for it. You can feel free to print it out and use it and have fun. Okay, in the event that your character takes a hit, let's talk about damage. Any damage that a character takes is reduced from their overall hit points. If a single attack, one attack, does more than the character's maximum hit points, which in our case is 15 points, then the character is dead. And do you remember earlier when we said that an impaling strike from a 45 automatic would do a minimum of 15 points of damage? That's right. So if I took an impaling strike from a 45 and I ain't got no armor, I am a guaranteed goner. If any single attack inflicts half or more of the character's maximum hit points, which in our case is 8, then that's considered a major wound. Once you receive a major wound, you will check the major wound box. Your character is going to automatically fall prone, and then they're going to have to make a constitution save, which in our character's case is 80, in order to remain conscious. Once your character's hit points reach zero, one of two things is going to happen. If you have no major wounds, then you're going to automatically fall unconscious. Providing that nothing comes along and kills your character while they're out, your character is going to survive to investigate another day. However, if you reach zero hit points and a major wound has been sustained, your character goes unconscious and begins the messy process of dying. At the end of the following round, the character is going to make a constitution save. If they don't make the constitution save, they die. They continue making these saves every single round until the character is either dead or another character comes along and successfully performs first aid on them. If first aid is successfully rolled, the dying character stabilizes with one temporary hit point, but they are not out of the woods yet. The injured character is going to need somebody to perform medicine on them within the next hour, otherwise they're going to have to make a constitution save at the end of that hour, and if they fail that roll, that one temporary hit point goes away and we start all over again. If the character makes the constitution roll, then they earn themselves one more hour of being stabilized in which somebody can perform medicine on them. Otherwise, at the end of that hour, they have to roll again and again and again until they either die or somebody comes along and performs medicine on them. Once medicine is successfully performed, the character receives one die three hit points, and at the end of the first week, they're allowed to have a constitution roll, and if successful, they gain another one die three hit points. There is a bonus die that they can have for these rolls if this is all taking place in a hospital or some sort of a similar environment. The major wound box can only be unchecked once the character either rolls an extreme success on their constitution check that they only get once a week, or once they've received over half their maximum hit points by doing that one die three a week even though they haven't gotten an extreme. Since this requires uh, some time, our character that has 8 hit points as their midpoint is going to take several weeks to recover in most cases. Now once the major wound box has been removed, the character can begin healing normally, and regular healing takes place at one point a day. But major wounds should still have some sort of penalty that comes with them, so what I recommend is that a keeper then roll that hit location chart to determine where the major wound was, and then note on the back of the character sheet a nice gnarly scar that the PC can remember that injury by. Keepers, you can also feel free to add your own little flares to it, such as a minus to attractiveness if it might happen to be on their face, 
or a minus one to their movement because they have a limp now because they took it in the leg. And as far as regular healing during the course of a normal game, a successful first aid roll heals only one point of damage. A successful medicine roll can heal one die three points of damage, but medicine takes a full hour in order to perform, so it can't really be done on the fly, and it definitely can't be done in the middle of combat. And before your players try to ask, you can't do first aid again until you've taken more damage. They can't just have it done to them over and over again until everybody's back up to full. The Keeper's Guide does have a handy damage flow chart that shows all of this, and I really suggest the Keepers also print this up and give this to all your players from to be able to reference in-game to keep your combats moving nice and smooth. And there you go. That is combat for Call of Cthulhu. Now, as you can see, it is extremely different than combat would be in other games such as Dungeons & Dragons. But that's also the beauty of it. Call of Cthulhu combat is scary. We ain't got no clerics, and we ain't got no healing potions to make our boo-boos go away. And we don't get no more hit points, no matter how much we improve. And this is a lot like real life. Combat is best avoided, but sometimes you can't avoid it. And when that fight comes up, you're not just going to stand there in one place, swinging your axe back and forth with the bad guy until one of you drops. No, you're going to dodge and you're going to move around and you're going to use strategy because in any fight, no matter how trivial, one bad move could land you weeks in the hospital or an eternity in a box. And that's it for this episode. Hopefully it was helpful for you. Next episode, we're going to be going over chase rules. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. If you want to see some more of this series, or if you want to see some reviews or other videos that we do, just hit that subscribe button. And if you have any requests for anything that you want us to clarify, or any other topics that you want us to touch on while we're doing this Call of Cthulhu series, just hit us up in the comments below. Until next time, gamers, you have a great day.